Welcome to the Pain Points Podcast. We enjoy telling the stories of everyday people, whether that be small business owners, entrepreneurs, or people with a passion for their community. We want to highlight them and give them a platform to share their story. So grab your favorite beverage and join us on today's episode where we tell the story of someone just like you. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode. I am your host, Sarah Harbuck, and with me is Kristen Ellis. Good morning. Our very special guest today is Dr. Sid Roberts. Hello. Good morning. Hello. Afternoon. What Thank time you. is it now? I don't it is afternoon. <laughs> right. It is know. afternoon. I was wrong. It's so nasty today that it's it feels like it's nighttime. So. Yes. Yes. Uh, Dr. Roberts is here with us today from the Temple Cancer Center at CHI. Correct. So he's got a very busy day, so we're going to get right on into it. Let everybody know a little bit about yourself, just like, you know, who you are, where you grew up, where you went to school, all the, you know, Family, bio, you oh know, my. biological Synop- little synopsis there. Yeah. Well, I for I, the few yeah. that don't know who you are, <laughs> I moved to Lufkin in uh, the very tail end of 1992. Uh, was so some time ago. Yeah, it's been a while. Okay. Uh, recruited here by the late Dr. Bill Shelton, who was um, uh, an icon in the community right. uh, yeah. as I well. Uh, I had been in practice as a radiation oncologist for about a year and a half when he recruited me here. Uh, uh, to go further back, I grew up in Midland, Texas. Oh, okay. wow. And my wife did as well. Good deal. We met in seventh grade band. That's Aww, a whole wow. other story. So y'all are like childhood uh, sweethearts. No, 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 no. We didn't date <laughs> until we were both in grad school, actually. Oh, wow. wow. But you've known each other so since seventh grade. we've known each other for a long time. Wow. That's very cool. But so we both grew up in Midland. I went to Rice University mm-hmm. uh, undergrad and then did my medical school training at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston and stayed there for my radiation oncology residency. Okay. And radiation oncology is a is an oncology specialty, but it, the specialization is radiation treatment for cancer as opposed to medical oncology, which is more of an internal medicine-based mm-hmm. subspecialty that does the chemotherapy, right. for example. Mm-hmm. We work very closely on probably the majority of our patients because patients with cancer get oftentimes uh, multiple get both, types right. of treatment, surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, etc. So anyway, end of 92 was when I, I moved here, and it was the best move I ever made. Aww. Wow. Hey. Well, we're so glad that you decided to come here. Yes. Because, you know, so, so oftentimes smaller towns like this don't always have, like, you know, the doctors that specialize in, in some of these types of fields, and right. they have to go to other cities or other places, and so to have our very own you know, specialists here in town is always very nice. And yes. Yeah, well, you know, people think of Lufkin as a town of 30, 35,000 people. Mm-hmm. But from a healthcare standpoint, Lufkin acts like a town of several hundred thousand, mm-hmm. really? perhaps even 400,000. Well, it services thousand. the entire county plus the surrounding that's true. counties. Yeah, it's probably a 12-county area. Mm-hmm. And so that's why in this in this little Lufkin, we have <laughs> radiation oncology, open heart surgery, right. neurosurgery, for example, because we do have a drawing area. And you know, the the chamber statistics uh, are pretty amazing. That our daytime traffic is over a hundred thousand in wow. Lufkin. So a oh, lot of people yeah. coming in and out. Yeah, uh, that explains why healthcare. I hate driving places. There's just a million people <laughs> well, on the road. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Did you um, always? When you were a kid, did you always want to be a doctor? Was that something that you kind of fell into later, you know, in, as a teenager or in college? Or kind of map us, map us out that journey for us. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually started off in college as a clarinet performance major. Wow. Wow, that's a completely different specialty. Yeah. <laughs> very, very different, but also very cool. Yeah, that's, yes. <laughs> that's, I ended up at Rice University because I auditioned to train with the principal clarinetist of the Houston Symphony. Wow. And thought that that was what I wanted to do. But in reality, piano is actually my main love mm. musically. Do you and still play? I do, actually. Yeah. The clarinet I and the piano? Don't play the clarinet anymore. Uh. But uh, yeah, I play uh, piano. I play uh, keyboards for First Baptist uh, okay. and you know synthesizer sorts of things. And, and still play 
at home as well. Nice. Got to have that hobby to yeah. separate the job, yes. work life, and have something yeah. to kind of give you peace and But I, I, I realized uh, <laughs> yes. after my freshman year that I loved music, mm-hmm. uh, but I didn't love to practice. And I think I also realized <laughs> I, that, you know, I was good, but I wasn't great. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it wasn't what I wanted to do to make a living. Yeah. Right. Uh, and I guess... You know, it's like I had other interests and and I loved the academic side of medicine, the always learning, the always doing something new and different. Right. And so that's really when I made the decision to to go to medical school. What uh, prompted your push into the specialty of radiate, radi- radiation oncology? Yeah. Ooh, so did I say that right? Yeah, you did. You did. You did. <laughs> it's Monday, uh, man. I'm telling you. And it's interesting because it, the answer to that question brings up the fact that I'm also a hospice and palliative care physician. Okay. So I'm board certified in radiation oncology and in hospice and palliative medicine. When I was in medical school, I was very fortunate to do a rotation with uh, a hospice physician. Hospice care was very new mm-hmm. um, in the late 80s. And I, I saw the care of uh, dying patients as a great melding of my spirituality, uh, my Mm -hmm. intellect, my humanism. And that was really what I thought being a physician was all about, not just doing procedures Right, yeah. but actually taking care of people, and mm-hmm. and for me, end of life care is is a very easy thing to do. Most most doctors aren't trained to either take care of people at the end of life or or to talk about mm-hmm. end of life right. issues. Well, their their main focus is to keep you well, and from, that, <laughs> you know, yeah, keep, to keep but, that from happening. And, but that's that's uh, that's a result of so many medical advances that took place starting in the 1960s, if you will. Mm -hmm. Well, or even earlier, if you talk about antibiotics, but think about uh, heart disease and heart care. Mm -hmm. We didn't have uh, coronary artery stents and bypass surgery and all that 70 years ago or so. A lot's changed in the last few decades. I think in in ICUs, Mm -hmm. we didn't used to have ICUs. It was very common for people to die in the home. Mm -hmm. And and families were, you know, raised and raised their kids knowing that there were multiple generations within the household that grandmother was going to get sick and and we're going to take care of her till she dies Mm -hmm. and not all this shipping everybody off to the hospital uh where you don't see them anymore and you and you put them on a you know a A ventilator ventilator and keep Mm -hmm. them alive forever so that's sort of i think we've been getting back to a more appropriate end of life care in that regard Mm -hmm. yeah but back to your (laughs) real question um i liked taking care of uh, terminal patients. Uh, a lot of them were cancer patients at the time, but I also liked treating and curing disease. And so radiation oncology was a great melding of those two Mm -hmm. because at the time I went into the field, probably 50% of my patients were curative attempt patients and 50% were comfort care. Mm -hmm. Now, course over the last generation we now cure more than 70 percent of cancers and so end of life care is is less of a focus in general but that being said hospice care now is also focused a lot more not just on cancer but alzheimer's copd end-stage heart Mm -hmm. disease and other illnesses that kill people yeah yeah my my father-in-law worked for um one of the local hospice chapters as a chaplain uh, just, you know, coming in and, and sitting with people who were, you know, just last days, you yeah. know, and, yeah. and, well, yeah. and then also had a rounds where he went and checked on people who were in hospice care right. that were maybe not, you know, right. dying right away, but they, they were heading in that direction. So I feel like you have to have a special 
personality or a spirit about you in order to yes. handle something that kind of is very emotionally heavy for some people. And you said it, you know, you said that it was an easy, kind of an easy thing. And I feel like it must be your personality is just geared towards giving and bringing people comfort. It's very empathetic. During a very, you know, yeah. can be a scary time, can be right. a sad time, you know. What is your, what is your experience well, with that? I, I, I think that's true. You know, people often ask or say, Oh, that must be the hardest thing in the world to do. Well, to me, if you're doing what you love and what mm -hmm. you're gifted to do, it's actually the easiest thing That's in true. the world. And yeah. I can't imagine myself doing anything else. I do think, um, I think personality does have a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. But I, I think a lot of it can be trained too. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if if your mindset is such that your only goal is to keep someone alive for as long as possible, no matter the cost, yeah, that's that's not right. No, no, I wouldn't want, you know, I you have would to, you want have to, to weigh be that quality yeah. of life. Yeah, yeah. that's right. a very paternalistic, right? Um, old Scott, old style medicine approach that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we've been moving away from that for decades. We're still not where we need to be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I would, and I think you know, to be honest, we we are we are separating medicine into just such individualized specialties today. Mm -hmm. For example, so many of the primary care physicians no longer follow their own patients in the hospital. If you go to the hospital, you get admitted to the hospitalist's service. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, the hospitalists are hired and specifically trained to take care of patients in the hospital. Once they're discharged, they have no follow-up with them, right? No obligation, and I and I don't want to say no care, sure, because I'm sure they do care. But it's just the model today is such that unless every step of the way people actually take a moment and ask the patient mm -hmm. how they feel, what they want, what are their goals in life, then those questions don't get answered and you just get shuffled on to the next specialty for the next mm -hmm. procedure or, God forbid, hooked up on a ventilator and then family's trying to decide what to do mm -hmm. right. because you can't make a decision anymore. Right, right. That is something that's very important. Uh, you know, having, you know, whether it be a will or somebody that just knows, don't do that to me. You know, it's it's not a fun topic. People don't want to think about it. They don't want to talk about it. But yep. it is a very important step. And it can prevent a lot of stress and anguish on your family. You know, mm -hmm. if, you know, say something happens and you're basically stuck in your body and you know what's going on, but you can't communicate, you know, that you're not ready to, you, you don't want this then you're just stuck there miserable. And it's, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things that go into that, but it's very yeah. important. It's difficult. There are cultural but, issues too. True, and, true. But people do need to learn to communicate, not just with their healthcare professionals, but with their family. Yes, with their family. Death is something yeah. people don't like talking about and, and thinking about, you know, yeah. but it's going to happen to all of us. Yeah. And being prepared for when that does come, you know, my, my, my grandfather had an aneurysm and he uh, went to the hospital. He survived, but he was put on a ventilator and machines were breathing for him mm -hmm. and he was basically brain dead. And he had told my grandmother and his children for years, I will not live like a vegetable. If something happens to me, pull the plug. And they did. Yeah. You know, they got all the family gathered to say goodbye yeah. and then my grandmother signed the paperwork and they turned everything off and then he passed away mm -hmm. and I'm thinking yeah that's what I would want too and so I've told my family the same thing right. and, and right. you know talking mm -hmm. about that stuff while well, it's uncomfortable and it can be hard it is a realistic thing that's going to happen and yeah. we should mm -hmm. be prepared and, and, it's great and having doctors if, that if, are if your family you know, all agrees yeah but if you haven't yeah, written it down difficult. yes yeah. you know, this is true so luckily, so. his family was always very, like, my dad and his siblings were just, they agreed with my grandmother. Everybody, you know, it was very peaceful and, like, it yeah. happened in the best way possible, you know. And, yeah, you, you hope that that's what happens going forward, you know. Um, and then having doctors that inform the family, 
you know, uh, say this is this is my opinion. This is my educated guess. You can let, let's we can bring in more people right. and, and making them feel as comfortable about that decision as possible. Because they didn't just rely, I think, on the one doctor's opinion. I think they brought in a couple of people sure. and just to make sure. But yeah, he was brain dead. Right. There was nothing that was going to happen. And yeah. and so, you know, that's a, I'm sure, you know, a tough thing to have to, to, to do with a family. But then to have somebody that's compassionate and that's empathetic, who's been through this process a bunch of times, you know, I want your expertise, you know, like, yeah. hey, doctor said, you know, yeah. <laughs> give me the lowdown. What's going to happen here? Communication. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And, and isn't that the key to so much? Yes. Oh, yeah, yes. definitely. Yes. I, I always love, I, I had a, a doctor who, he would apologize because he would explain things. He would, you know, you know, explain it, explain it like I'm five. And he would, you know, I, I don't mean to talk down to you. I'm like, no, no thank you <laughs> give me as much information and treat me like a five-year-old because i have no idea what you're talking about but yeah. thank you for trying to communicate and explain you know explain that i think that's a that's a very important thing and i know i've run into situations with family members where you know you were speaking about the hospitalists and so the there was there was that lack of communication and i don't think it was necessarily on purpose but it was the paperwork that got in the way and, and all that sort of thing between the primary care provider and, and the hospitalist and some wires got crossed and things that needed to get done didn't get done, that kind of thing. Um, so is there a, this is just me being curious, is, is there a, I've heard other doctors talk about the paperwork and, oh. the, yeah, <laughs> you know. Paperwork is, upon is, paperwork is upon there, paperwork. <laughs> uh, is there a, um, hmm. A solution on the horizon, or well, not necessarily that, but is there yeah. is there something that you've learned to deal to help deal with that sort of thing, or like a well, like I think a coping you mechanism, know, a coping mechanism. <laughs> yeah. Philosophically, mm-hmm. um, one of the reasons I was running a little late today is my philosophy is whoever's in front of me at the time is the only person in the world. Yes, that's important, and, and you need to especially in healthcare, you need to be able to tune out the distractions, tune yeah. out the cell phones, mm-hmm. uh, the messages, <laughs> and focus on the on the patient. The problem with electronic health records is they make it very difficult to focus on the patient mm-hmm. when you've got all of these government mandated metrics that have to be answered and filled out. Yeah oftentimes real time while you're sitting in front of the patient i've written about this before mm-hmm. as a matter of fact that i i don't take a laptop into the room with me when i see patients because it's a distraction mm-hmm. so i do my charting afterward well that may mean the next person waits while i finish up my charting or a pile of charts builds up that you've got to finish sure. doing sure. later and and again, it's it's a byproduct of of our healthcare reimbursement system mm-hmm. that the federal government has one goal, and although they state it may be quality, it's not. It's saving money, and how are they going to save money except by putting in metrics to weed out who's who's doing a quote unquote good job or a bad job, documenting what they want documented, mm-hmm. and so the fight is. Well, I've got to document, and that's right. not quality it's care. It's quality of care versus, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, that's, that's it. That brings up an interesting um, conversation, and I know we don't have a tremendous amount of time to delve into the all the aspects. That could be a whole series <laughs> of podcasts. But you bring up an excellent point about bureaucratic red tape and mm-hmm. governmental red tape and insurance. All, the whole thing is just like a big ball of twine just in a big old knot and it's just not getting any better and as a doctor you know you're you're right in the middle of it and I'm sure you can see both sides um you know in in an ideal world uh what would be a a, a slightly better solution than what we have now um is is that even is that even that's a pretty complex question it's a complex question and and no matter what answer you have, you're going to get skewered oh, sure. by somebody. There's sure. always another perspective to yeah. look at it from. I mean, right? it, it, people, it's, it's also an example of the grass always being greener on the other side. Mm-hmm. Sure. It's easy to look at other systems and say, well, everybody has health insurance here or health care coverage or, um, 
you know, physicians are employed here or whatever. But any any give has some take, sure, if sure. you will. Right. So I think uh, in the United States, at least, we value physician independence, mm -hmm. independent decision making, the quote unquote doctor patient relationship where <laughs> you and I decide what's best for you right. and not somebody else telling us what to do. But in some ways, those are a little straw men, too. Um, we all are incentivized negatively, I think, when it comes to the way the reimbursement system is set up as far as procedures are concerned. I mean, that's probably the biggest problem in our healthcare system right now. Those of us who are in specialties that do procedures mm -hmm. are reimbursed for doing more procedures, whereas those that are in oh. primary care that sit down and hold the hand of the patient aren't reimbursed as equitably for their time, for their time. With, mm -hmm. with the patient. Sure. You know, the only way to change that is a drastic redo of the whole healthcare reimbursement system. And there's just not the stomach or will yeah. to do that. That takes, yeah. you know, congressional action. <laughs> and they're they only, move really slow. The, the only care they have is getting reelected. So it's right. never going to happen. This is true. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, sad, I, I, you know, I. I've been on the both sides of that particular argument. In fact, at the beginning of this year, I had to have emergency surgery on my eye and don't have insurance uh, in that in that for that. And um, because I didn't have insurance, I actually had a lot more freedom to get things done very quickly. Mm -hmm. And they scheduled it the very next day, and all the things just boom, 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 boom. Yeah. And she was like, the, the lady helping me, she was like, you know, this. It's probably one of the easiest ones I've had today because we didn't have to call an insurance company and get you your approval to do right. X, Y, and yeah. Z. It's an emergency. And, and by federal law, luckily, emergency care must be managed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now. But there was no, there was no they, had, they, had, <laughs> they didn't have to have any conversation. Right. It was literally just like, oh, right. can you pay? Good. All right, let's do that. I mean, yeah, even if yeah, I couldn't yeah, have, yeah. I think they yeah. probably would have worked with me. But, yeah. you know, in your, your line of work, you know, cancer... Cancer is a really long process to cure mm -hmm. and to get over, and and it's very expensive. And I, you know, I've I've had conversations with people, and you know, I've even joked myself as like, if they find something, I don't know if I can afford to treat it. Right. And mm -hmm. I feel like there's there's a lot of people like me, and that you know, they don't go get the treatment or the they they don't go see their doctor like they should about things because well there's just going to mean more tests and more expense and then what right. if they find something right. and it costs a million dollars to try to to fix it yeah. you're in a field where you know it's a it's a long-term process and that happens a lot you know what do you what do you do to help well, patients yeah so i practice at a nonprofit hospital system and the reason I do is because I have never turned away a patient for inability to pay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've also never sent a patient to a collection agency. But I have the luxury of doing that because I have a good income and I'm just, I'm just not going to do that. Mm -hmm. right. So my livelihood isn't dependent on a collection agency. Right. And my, my staff are going to take care of whatever patients they have to take care of. What's one more patient if we're already treating X, Y, Z a day? Mm -hmm. I mean, so there's, again, it's a luxury. Treating people like human beings with a problem yeah. rather than a number on yes, a form. Yes, but, yes, but the, But the problem is I never, I never know exactly who has what insurance plan because mm. they're all different oh yeah too. so different <laughs> yeah. and so it's so, so confusing if, if you've got you know medicare then it's whatever supplemental and do mm. they require whatever prior authorization if it's standard insurance they almost all require authorizations it's the poor people who and of course if you qualify for charity care then then you're covered also mm -hmm. but it's the it's it's the the sad donut hole people who make more money than would qualify for charity care but don't have insurance, who gets stuck with the whole bill, mm -hmm. yeah. not a reduced bill, mind you, yeah. that, <laughs> that makes it really tough. Now, 
the the other issue too is some cancers, breast cancer, cervical cancer, there are uh, state and federal programs that can help mm-hmm. with with mm-hmm. coverage, but patients don't know that, yeah. so they have to actually get into the system and have knowledgeable people who are going to figure out, navigate, if you will, the system for them and with them mm. to know what can be covered. I guess my my only point there would be everybody should be able to get the care they need. It's yes. just much harder for some people than others, and you have to fight for yourself, and you have to navigate the system and hope that the people that you are seeing are going to navigate the system with you. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a challenge because, I mean, I've been lucky enough that most of the doctors I've interacted with in my life have have had more of your philosophy and um, have more, uh, let me help you out, or, you know, my staff is going to help you, Mm -hmm. or, you know, this thing with my eye just came out of nowhere, wasn't prepared, and they (laughs) they really walked me through the whole thing, and I very much appreciate, uh, you know, that uh, that side of it. Because it can be very scary when you've been told something you have no control over and oh by right. the way you've got to go to Houston tomorrow and have a surgery to fix this before yeah. you go blind um, <laughs> you right. know and so having those people tell you you know what's what and how to you know how to do things now you know if you've been in a situation like that you kind of learn and so the next time if something comes up you can kind of but mm-hmm. for those that like you said that have no idea just you know well we live in a in an area of the state where uh, education level is lower than the rest of the state income Mm -hmm. level is lower than the rest of the state and then a lot of health metrics Mm -hmm. are worse than the rest of the state i mean i have a good friend who's got a an ivy league mba who's trying to navigate (laughs) medicare Supplemental plans. Mm-hmm. Yes. I mean, it's I know. how do you? You must do need like this? a degree in it. So, I was say, that's <laughs> exactly. A, I was just about to say we need somebody to get a degree in like that sort of thing or just medical management. Become an <laughs> in, become an expert and start their own business where you just you you hire them and you pay like a nominal fee or part of your insurance pays for it and they just help you navigate the insurance we need we yeah need. It, it and it changes all the time oh it does you can get authorizations and the insurance companies say well just because we gave you an authorization doesn't mean we're obligated to pay <laughs> you know they hold <laughs> the, so the keys and the power but it is frustrating yes well, well let's let's move on from that because yeah. we could probably yes, talk about that yes, for two or three yes. more hours and um, we're not going to solve anything yeah so. um <laughs> walk us through kind of your typical what it looks like for you a typical day looks like for you and and maybe m- more in layman's terms explain to everybody what your specialty um entails ah well um so, <laughs> what, what you can share anyway yeah no as as a um as a cancer doctor we'll start at that level mm-hmm. Um, I get referrals from other cancer doctors, from surgeons, from ENTs, uh, dermatologists, and such, uh, for patients who have been diagnosed with cancer Mm -hmm. to determine whether or not radiation therapy is going to be a part of their treatment course. So... And do you cover a multitude of cancers, or oh, do you yeah. specialize in... We don't do pediatrics, because okay. most kids with cancer are on research protocols. So they're going to be treated at major medical institutions. But other than that, just about any and all. Now, cancer is not one disease. Cancer is hundreds of diseases. And each cancer may be treated differently. Mm -hmm. So a person who has a cancer diagnosis needs to know whether their particular cancer is best treated by surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, or a combination of the three. Mm -hmm. Some cancers, there are multiple options for how to treat it. And so it becomes a discussion of what is the best option for a particular patient in their particular circumstance. So the the best um, care, I think, is multidisciplinary care. In other words, if you have a cancer diagnosis, are you talking to all the specialties that are going to be involved in your care? Do they talk amongst themselves? Do, sure. Is the plan coordinated mm-hmm. uh, in that regard? So um, I think a lot of what I do uh, is initial consultation with cancer patients to determine whether or not radiation therapy is going to be a portion of their care. 
and if so, when and where and how. Mm -hmm. um, as patients are going through their radiation treatment, um, I'm monitoring that treatment process and seeing them uh, at least weekly along the way to see mm -hmm. how they're doing with their with their care. And then there's follow up afterwards, sure. uh, again, to monitor the results of the treatment. So we spend a lot of time when patients first come to us just on the educational aspect of right of their cancer and what does that mean and how is it treated having and lots of conversations basically. lots of conversations yeah. <laughs> good deal do you do you perform you don't perform any surgeries or anything like that you strictly oversee the radiation yeah i mean there there are some um some procedures that we do related to the radiation treatment but uh for the most part the daily radiation therapy and that's one way radiation therapy differs from other mm -hmm. cancer treatment. It's a daily treatment five days a week for a specified period of sure. time that could be a couple of weeks. It could be seven and a half weeks mm -hmm. or so. Right. Depends on the cancer and all. But most patients are coming in every day, Monday through Friday, for about 15 or 20 minutes for a treatment that lasts several minutes, yeah. if you will. Okay. Good deal. And so they've got their daily time and it's just a schedule for them. So you can see quite quite a volume of patients in a day. If, yeah. If I mean, if I'm seeing everybody that's under treatment on a given day, that could be 30 people wow. uh, that day. But other days, it's longer periods of time with fewer patients doing the initial consultations or their follow-ups or things like that. That's something I've always admired about doctors is their ability to recognize and remember people. Because, mm -hmm. like, if Sarah, if I didn't see you at least once a week, I would probably forget your name. Yeah. <laughs> and we've known each other for a while. I'm really good at remembering like faces. Years. But whether or not I'll remember your name is a whole other thing. I'll be like, I know you, but yeah. I can't remember. Well, doctors are the hey, same way. You? you know, I'll see someone and I may not remember their name, but it's like, Oh, yeah. That's the diagnosis they had. That, that was a colon cancer. Right, you yes. Know, and right. I I've had a doctor tell, tell you all about that. your anatomy. Right, but. right. I may not remember your name, but I remember yeah. your case. Yeah. Yes, yes. I mean, it, it, you know, that's... I, that in a way is kind of, I mean, just as important as knowing their it's name because you know true. that that's well, that's your association you have with that person. But the problem you know. is that sometimes or too often, you become that colon cancer yeah. and you're no longer that person. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so be careful with yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. I would is imagine that something tricky. that is? Um, I don't know. Do doctors? I, I, my sister is a veterinarian, which is a doctor of a very different kind. Um, but uh, she has to do, you know, continuing education and things like that. Is it something that, you know, oncologists and, and, and you continue oh, yeah. to? I know I mean, there the are state requirements always... for, for continuing medical education. Right. And, and then within your specialties, there's uh, maintenance of certification, if you will, for your board sure, certification. Sure. So, yeah. Yeah, all that, all that fun stuff. Yeah. Why don't you tell everybody what board certification means? Because I follow a, a doctor on uh, Instagram, and she just went through that process. So I'm familiar, but I didn't know until I heard her talk it's, about it. What all that? I see board certified and da 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 da, da. What does big, that mean? It's a big deal. Well, <laughs> you know, historically, um, I mean, we're talking history, mm -hmm. like 100 years ago or whatever. Um you could practice medicine if you went to medical school and then did what was called an internship. Sure. Mm -hmm. And then an internship was typically one year mm -hmm. after medical school. And you could go hang up your shingle and you could practice as a doctor. Mm -hmm. Now that would, in, in the old days, that was called general practice. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that would have been a GP, a general mm -hmm. practitioner. Okay. okay. So people think that that's the same thing as family practice. But it's not because family practice is actually a residency training. It's a specialty mm -hmm. in family medicine. So th though you technically could practice medicine after an internship, nobody does because right. you really don't know anything. You're still a baby doctor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so you, you, you have to enter a residency program. And that could be family practice, internal medicine. It could be general surgery or radiation oncology or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's after that residency training that you then become board eligible, eligible to take the boards for certification in your specialty. Sure. Sometimes you have to wait a year or two after your residency and complete logs of training and cases and things like mm -hmm. that. 
it used to be that board certification was a lifetime certification. And in fact, in my specialty of radiation oncology, I'm grandfathered as board certified for my career. Mm -hmm. uh, they've changed it since then and made them time limited certifications. So they're good okay. for anywhere from seven to 10 years or so, depending on the specialty. And then you have to recertify. So you have to go through um, either a certain amount of continuing education, but typically another exam, a recertification exam in order to maintain your certification. And then there's this whole animal called maintenance of certification, which <laughs> a lot of specialties are using to replace the every seven year exam, mm -hmm. because some people think that that's not fair and whatever. <laughs> but you, you don't have to be board certified to practice. Now, some hospital systems require board certification to be on their medical staff, but that's not always necessary. Mm. It's just a little right. extra step to show people, hey, this person has been through the ring. I think it's important, ring. yeah, yeah, to, for, yeah, as a quality indicator. Well, and, and medicine is always, you know, it's it's called a practice on purpose. Like it's always evolving. It's always changing. We're always, research is finding out new things and we're, we're constantly, testing theories and constantly my practice learning. currently is so different than what it was at the end of 92 when I moved here. There you go, uh, yeah. Almost everything I do did not exist at yeah. that time. Yeah, so, so it's important to, to keep, keep up. up, yeah, to, to have, have all yeah. of that and so you continue to learn. It just it shows me, okay, this person had some fortitude to continue on and take this right. really hard test. Right, yeah. right. Board to be like, okay, well, yes. they passed that, then they really must know their thing, their stuff here. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about this, the elephant in the room that's existed for all of us for a little over the last year. You are a cancer doctor for all intents and purposes. And, you know, people with cancer were at a higher risk for COVID than, you know, say the general population. And mm. all the things that have been going on with you know management of this disease or the, the virus and people protocols and and how has your practice changed this last year did you see a lot more people over zoom and teleconferencing or <laughs> I'm guessing that's not really possible if you're treating them with procedures yeah. and what have you well so. we we um when the pandemic first hit I think everybody was pretty devastated for a few months. Mm -hmm. uh, the hospitals basically all shut down as far as outpatient imaging right. and testing was concerned. Right. Um, so we had patients who were under treatment and we continued their treatment. We you know, enhanced all of our safety protocols within the cancer center. But we got very slow for several months. Yeah. And it took a while for uh, referrals to build back up. And in fact, it's only really been in the last couple of months that we've gotten back to what I would consider a normal. There are, there are some studies out there that are finally able to analyze and see that, yeah, sure enough, people delayed cancer diagnoses mm -hmm, during this mm -hmm, yeah. uh, pandemic. You, if you can't get your mammogram, you're not getting your breast cancer diagnosed. If right. you can't you know, get your pap smear done, you're not getting your cervical cancer diagnosed lung cancer sure. uh, people were presenting uh late with that as well so uh, it, it was an issue for sure mm -hmm. but i think uh, especially post vaccination i'm seeing um, a lot of our medicare age population are finally getting back into their doctor's offices and getting their routine exams done mm -hmm. and getting back on a schedule as right. a as a medical professional have you especially in this area where it seems to be a mixed bag of, of, of ideals when it comes to covid and mask wearing and vaccination have you seen that a lot more people are actually getting vaccinated than it or or is it is it kind well, of yeah it's yeah. interesting i mean my be, because the number one risk factor for cancer in general is age sure right. um, most of my patients are medicare age most of my patients were eligible for the vaccination early on. Mm -hmm. Right. And so uh, I would say the majority of my patients have been vaccinated. I mean, there's there's still a lot of misinformation and hesitancy out there. Right. Uh, sure. For sure. But, uh, yeah, I, I, think, I think we're... 
And I think the statistics show nationwide, probably 70% or so of the elderly population is vaccinated now. That's yeah, good. good. So yeah. that's good. It's, yes. it's the younger population <laughs> who think that they are invincible at this yeah. point or oh. that if they're going to get it, well, it's just going to be a mild case. And so why, why do I even need to worry about a vaccine. It's not yeah. for you, it's but, for everyone else. Well, yeah, you it's, know. It's a bit of both. But we, we're, that's not us anymore. That's not our society. Yes. We're, we're very self-centered, yes. dare I say self-ish. Ish. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I got to say, this last year has taken a toll on my mental outlook of, of humanity as a whole. And I don't know, as a doctor, how, you, how you've managed to keep the faith that humanity is not lost and that people aren't terrible because I've watched, you know, people in, in this community and other people, other places just, you know, be incredibly selfish and, and not work together to help each other kind of combat this thing that everybody yeah. on the planet has had to deal with. How do you, what do well, you do to so help, you it, know, mitigate that? Yeah. I mean, the, uh, we, we can delve into personal <laughs> philosophy sure. now, uh. but um, I think, there, there's two sides to that coin. And on the, on the one side of the coin, theologically speaking, um, I'm a firm believer in uh, original sin, if you will, that we're all fallen, that yes. we, are, we are not all good. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're not as bad as we could be, but we're not, <laughs> we're not all good. Yeah. So. You know, we, we fight and we struggle mm-hmm. against that inner nature, if you will. On the other side of that coin, um, gee, I'm a fourth generation West Texan. I'm a proud Texan, proud American. And and I've always thought that America's going to do it right. You know, <laughs> that, that we're going to... pretty ingrained t- in our yeah, philosophy. Of we're American gonna take exceptionalism. Care. <laughs> exactly. Yes. We're going to take care of each other. Yeah. Yes. And, I, and 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 to your point, I think that 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 honestly is where my my faith in humanity, if you will, has been sorely tested because yeah. we we our selfishness has just kind of become the dominant yes. uh, characteristic. Yeah. 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 Sadly. Yeah. That has been the case, and, I and I, I definitely see both sides of what you're talking about there. So sorry, Kristen. Go no, ahead. No, no, it's fine. I was just going to. I think that. Uh, there was a lot of, at the beginning of this, <clears throat> there was a lot of misinformation and, and things. And I believe that if it had been marketed differently, <laughs> yeah. you will say, yeah. you know, and it had been a, let's do this and pull together and, you know. Very World War Two kind of like, yeah, you know, like, pull it together for the yeah, troops, you know. Can, you know and yeah, that was my about... last column, Rosie the Riveter. You yes. Know, yes. She would have gotten vaccinated. Yes. You know, rolled up that sleeve. You know, and yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. Was, you know, that's, Everybody that's, would have followed gonna, along. Right. We're going to take, this is going to be hard. We're, we're Americans. We can do this. We can pull yeah. together. We can, you know. But that was unfortunately not the way it was handled, and, and that uh, exacerbated some some problems yeah <laughs> what do you think uh, you know uh, going forward you know do we th- you think that we've not we haven't beaten covid that's probably going to be around for a while but do well, you think that, that there's a positive outlook to kind of give us some hope here well at the end? you know that just this last week with the cdc relaxing the mask requirements mm-hmm. in in public and indoors especially for those who are vaccinated has been revelatory for people uh, it, it's an end is in sight, maybe. I, yes. I th- well, I, at least a a, a denouement. Manageable. Yeah, uh, it, it's we can live with mm-hmm. that. Yeah, yeah. And I think we will be living with that for mm-hmm. a while. Yes. Um, it gives us a, some breathing room, that's for sure. Yes. Literal breathing actual, room. Actual, exactly. actual breathing room. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I I would love to continue to talk to you even and even longer, but you are a very busy doctor, and we've got to let you get yes, back to your 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 to day. You. Patients but, that need you. Yes, but we really appreciate you, Doctor Roberts, coming by and just having this very brief conversation with us about what you do and and all the things that you've got going on. Um, and we thank very much you appreciate for, you. 
thank you for what you do. Yes, yes, and, and well, for... thank you, thank you. I mean, uh, uh, this it, this has actually been a joy and good, good deal. Happy to do it. Good so. deal. Yeah. Well, tell everybody where they can um, maybe get in touch with your office, or if you are on social media in any capacity, even just for fun, um, where they can find you. Sure. Well, I'm at the the Temple Cancer Center at CHI St. Luke's Health Memorial. Uh, you can find me on the web at angelinaradiation.com. Uh, and that's probably the, the place if you have some specific information you want about me or, or what we do. Mm-hmm. Angelinaradiation.com is a good place to go. Good okay. deal. Well, we'll have to have you back sometime and, and go yes. and have more conversation about this because uh, yes. I could have probably sat here and talked to you for like three hours. <laughs> I have so many things I wanted to ask, but you've got to get back to your patients. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank we you. hope everybody enjoyed yes. this different format with a, with a doctor today, and uh, we hope you guys have a great week. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. You'll have a good one. Bye-bye. Do you have a story to tell? We want to hear it. If you'd like to be a guest on our podcast and share your story, contact us on our website at painpoints.com or any of the social media linked on our website. Be sure to subscribe and follow us on either Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or YouTube. We'd appreciate a review, a like, or a comment to let us know what you think. You can find all of our podcasts linked on our website under the podcast tab. Once again, thanks for joining us, and we want to wish everybody a wonderful day.